Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started and we may have some folks kind of jumping on um, as we go. And uh, for individuals who don't know who I am, I'm um, Amber Valengas and uh, I'm your host for this evening for this uh, wonderful event with uh, author Aya Gruber, who is the author of The Feminist War on Crime, uh, The Unexpected uh, role of women's liberation in mass incarceration. So, uh, Aya, thank you so much for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you. Well, it's really uh, a pleasure, and I was just very flattered that you would pick my book to be your first book club pick, so I'm pleased to be here. Oh, thank you so much. So, I'm going to go over a few things in terms of um, housekeeping and then we'll kind of um, and, and format so people can kind of understand, you know, how things are going to work. Um, and then we will kind of just jump into it. So um, for those who are on the line, um, we are going to follow a question and answer format. So uh, if you utilize um, over in your controls, you'll see a raise hand function. So if you utilize that raise hand function, then I will give you um, the audio so that you can speak to ask um, Aya a question. We're going to, um, there'll be a little bit more information about the book club after the event because we really want to maximize uh, Aya's time to really kind of dig deep into this wonderful work that she's put out into the world. Um, if you, um, you won't be able to necessarily be seen when you're asking a question. For those who are asking questions, you can also use the chat feature if you would prefer me to ask the question on your behalf. Um, and uh, so, so that's really the, the logistics of it. And so I'm going to start things off with uh, giving Aya a little bit of time to talk about herself, and then I'll start it off with question number one, and we'll move into uh, kind of the, the discussion. It's, it's a really informal type of situation, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the people have been reading your book and excited about your book, and um, I'm sure they have very specific questions for you. So Aya, if you want to just talk a little bit about yourself and the book, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, so I'm a law professor at the University of Colorado Law School. I teach um, mainly in the areas of criminal law and criminal procedure. So I teach a required criminal law and criminal procedure class. But I also teach um, uh, seminars on feminist theory, critical theory, critical race theory, and sort of the intersection between all those kind of identity-based movements and you know, the, the American criminal system. I've been a law professor since 2002. Before that, I was a public defender in Washington, D.C., uh, in the Washington, D.C. Uh, court system. And I was also a federal public defender in Miami, Florida. Um, and so sort of from that, I saw, you know, up close uh, the workings of the carceral system in the United States. So, um so, I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll start back at the very beginning, um, how I came to this topic. I think, you know, ever since I was young, um, I had a deep skepticism of government detention schemes and sort of these ide ideas of mass detention. My mother uh, had been in internment camps in World War II. Um, and she was interned because she's Japanese American, an American citizen. Um, so it was a, a race based detention. And so, you know, so always growing up, you know, there was this sense that the government really has this great power to detain and inflict pain on its citizens. And it can do so in a racialized way. So that was sort of like one side of, and, you know, and it's really funny because even from junior high school, I wanted to be a public defender, which I think is weird. I think, you know, people want to be like dancers and stuff. I was like, I don't want to be a public defender. Um, but there was also this really 
feminist side. So I was born in the 70s. I grew up in the 80s. And it was kind of, you know, a, a, a heyday of this second wave feminist activism. And much of that activism was about, you know, taking violence against women seriously, right? So this idea that you measure, you know, so first when I was a little kid, it was all about like, well, I, you know, what if I want a career and I want to have kids, I want to be a lawyer. And it was that kind of feminism, that kind of like right to work you know, economic feminism. But, you know, the, the, the older I got, the more I realized that a lot of the feminism revolved around men's bad sexual, sexual, and violent behavior. And so I really became identified with this notion that feminism was all about fighting the oppression of women, which translated into this sort of fast violence, you know, not like structural conditions, but this like individual violence against women. And then I had this second idea that, okay, well, how do we fight against individual violence against women? Well, we throw the men in jail, right? Like that was just like a natural connection I had. So by the time I went to law school, I was like fully in what I've called this feminist defense attorney dilemma, which is, okay, I know I want to be a defense attorney and represent, you know, the most marginalized people, the most vulnerable people against the, you know, massive detention power of the state that is used in a racially discriminatory manner. But, you know, I really don't want to represent these batterers and rapists because they're the worst of the worst. And that'd be a really unfeminist thing to do. So that's kind of like where this whole dilemma came from. And then when I started practicing, you know, I, I realized that it was less of a dilemma than I thought. I practiced in one of these specialized domestic violence courts in Washington, D.C., where, you know, feminists really built it. It was a court that took domestic violence seriously. And what I saw was this, you know, of, <laughs> It's funny because the whole of the D.C. criminal system, for the most part, I mean, you get your really bad crimes, but for the most part, it's a revolving door of processing and incarcerating poor people of color. And instead of that being somehow different and more enlightened in domestic violence court, it was like even worse. You know, there were, there were more people, more people dragged in who were like were really ambivalent about the system. A lot of the women themselves are like, look, I called the police. I want help. I want some options. But I don't ne I can't necessarily even afford for him to go to jail. And I also saw these um, immigrant women who you know, realized that they had called the police for help, but they triggered a, a penal machine that just went forward, you know, with or without their consent that made their partner deportable, sometimes them deportable. And I saw, you know, even some of the women end up as clients, right, um, for their own neglect charges and things like that. So it was a whole system that wasn't um, immune to the pathologies of the carceral state. But in fact, there seem to be even more pathologies because the feminist intervention had had been to make this system automatic. Like uh, police can't put a stop to it. Prosecutors can't put a stop to it. And victims can't put a stop to it. So it actually had elevated some of these pathologies. So then like a zillion years ago when I became a professor, you know, I started writing about sort of the dark side of these feminist reforms. Um, because even though they had been in place for 10, 20 years, um, I think, you know, it the literature, the academic literature was still stuck in the aspirational, like, oh, look, we've made these feminist courts and we just need to put more, you know, investment into them. So I started saying, well, actually, like, let's look at it from a public defender perspective. So that's what I had done for many years. I'd looked at very various different areas where we've criminalized gender crime sort of more than other crimes and how it intersected with that critique of mass incarceration. But it, it wasn't until I started writing this book that I really dug into sort of the historical aspect of it. Like, how did we get to the place where I was in law school, where feminism was defined in terms of violence against women, and then the solution to violence against women was uh, defined in terms of policing, prosecution, and prison. And so that's really where just I went on this journey of this book to figure out how did we get to this state of affairs that I don't think is really great for, you know, justice, you know, in the criminal sphere or feminism. And, you know, maybe if we learn something about how we got here, we can learn how to claw back from the edge. 
Right. Well, I have to say that um, I found the book to be extremely well researched. Um, I can't even imagine the amount of time and work and passion and sweat, blood and tears that that went into it. So I really appreciate having learned so much about the history and um, a lot of times how uh, women who are really kind of pushing forward and, and really wanting change that they feel will really help women, um, kind of uh, the, the social uh, constructs that kind of were happening around them that um, led to some of these negative outcomes that perhaps weren't even realized at the time. I, I found that yeah. very um, interesting. Yeah, it's interesting because some weren't realized, some were. Some were like strategic right. compromises. Some were, you know, hey, you know, I pushed this reform through and I've got the police unions on my side and that's successful. And who, you know, what other like left movement can claim that, you know, and sometimes success is addictive. But, you know, you know, you look back, you know, one factor that that pops out and a lot of feminists of color have have noted this in, in their books. There are whole books written on this, but you know, a lot of the times when feminists said women, we're going to we're going to help women, you know, from gaining the vote, <laughs> you know, to um, everything else. Women were always envisioned as white women, maybe as middle class women. And so it could be true that some of these criminal law reforms were kind of good for them. And, you know, it's interesting, like today you're seeing a lot of a lot of awareness of the intersection of race and gender. And so this Karen thing and like, why do white women, you know, like call the police? Well, maybe, you know, policing is a different proposition for a certain class of women. Now, I found that in, you know, domestic violence, you know, white women too could be, you know, depending on if they were poor, dependent on husbands, immigrants, they could also be very vulnerable to the policing. But they were, you know, less vulnerable than women of color, right? So there was always this tension, like, what do you mean by women, right? And who are you counting? Like, whose perspective are you taking? So that's one of the explanations. Another one is, especially if you look at, um, you know, we all, we all think of feminist criminal law reform in the 70s and 80s, like now, and sort of take back the night and domestic violence and date rape. But really, like, you know, you see from my book, it, I mean, it's been going on since there was an American women's movement. And in fact, one of the reasons some of the suffragists wanted the vote, right, worked so hard for the vote is they're like, well, we want political power so that we can address violence against women. So it was really the, the, the criminal aspects were there from the beginning. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that drove at least the late 20th century move to criminal law, what some people call the carceral feminist term, you hear that carceral feminist going around. Um, so like one of the things that drove it was this sense that feminists had that, you know, we just lived in a world where law and police and criminal law and state officials tolerated, even glorified violence against women. So it almost became definitional where we believe that there's been this widespread tolerance. So even just inserting criminal law into that space means that women have moved forward. So it was like almost a symbolic victory, but it was based a little bit about a, on a misunderstanding of history. I mean, these early criminal law campaigns against rapists and batterers, they were harsh. We're talking death penalty, whipping you at the post, harsh. And they were carried out against a lot of men and way disproportionately men of color. But I think like, you know, just going along with the stock narrative that, you know, the law tolerates violence against women, the law to really um, made feminism a little myopic to what happens when the law doesn't tolerate violence against women. And is that a good thing? And we actually had a lot of historical examples of like not so great things happening, like like feminist prohibition, right? The drunkard husband. Prohibition wasn't so great. The the anti-vice, anti-prostitution, you know, um, movement of the progressive era that landed 
teenage girls in reformatories throughout the nation. Like those weren't so great, right? The immigration reforms that were meant to stop sex trafficking that led to the ICE system we have now. You know, so, so we had all those things. And yet I think the narrative was so insistent on the problem being not enough criminal law that, you know, criminal law became the solution. So, so that's an interesting part of it. Okay. So um, I, I, I do want to open it up to some questions to our attendees. Um, I wanted, before we move on to that, I wanted to, um, you know, ask the question, um, I found it very interesting in the book that you really focused um, a lot of the book around domestic violence, domestic violence and different feminist responses to that. And you cover how kind of the every woman claim became the prevailing theory and arrest is best was like the loudest battle cry. So could you unpack that a little bit? You alluded a little bit to it in, in our our discussion but can you unpack that a little bit more about like why that wasn't a good thing yeah absolutely and so the every woman which is such a great term you know put together every woman that uh comes from beth ritchie who's a fantastic criminologist and she wrote probably the book on how you know these criminal law reforms and and, and not just the feminist ones just sort of tough on crime in general, um, really negatively impacted black women. Her book is called Arrested Justice. And it's, you know, you should have that on your, your reading list for sure. It's All right, I'm, I'm putting it on. Old, but yeah, but Beth Ritchie, Arrested Justice. Um, and so she also deals with domestic violence. And it is really true that one of the catchphrases, right? And this came from that moment in the 80s where like everybody was watching movies about domestic violence and like it, there was this great awareness, which was great. In a way, this was great. Like, no, you know, um, it's not cute when a woman, you know, is subject to violence. That's not a normal thing. That's not part of being in a hetero cis couple, right? Like that's, so this moment of awareness was great. Um, but at the same time, it revolved around really iconic images. So Farrah Fawcett was in this movie, The Burning Bed, and that became like a sensation. There were these high profile stories of women being killed and the police being nonchalant. And then there was the O.J. Simpson case. So there was really an iconic face of the domestic violence victim. And it was a beautiful, even a blonde, right? white woman who was subjected to horrific violence, tried to leave, you know, was, was good that way, didn't want to stay. And then, you know, the husband sort of stalked and tracked, which was true of, of some women, like, right, this was a narrative, but it really didn't represent the complexity of, of, of domestic violence and sort of the fact that it was a product of many social pathologies and, you know, women just vulnerable in life economically you know, they were more tied to batterers. Um, you know, if, if racial discrimination also affected their lives, they were also more vulnerable. Um, marginalized men were, you know, under more, more stress that could lead to be. So anyway, so it, it ignored all these factors. And so one of the mantras that came out of that era was domestic violence happens equally across the socioeconomic and racial spectrum. It's the same in a mansion as it is in, you know, subsidized housing type of thing or amongst a homeless family. And that just purely wasn't true, right? Like they were very different. They had sort of different stories and they, you know, different options, with, you know, different options for the women. And so within short order, like this idea that, okay, there is this essentialized, you know, one face of battered women became like the idea of this white woman hiding behind big sunglasses, you know, keeping the dirty secret of battering to herself, right? And, and that was true of some women, but the, but the thing about it was there were more marginalized women saying like, look, we think what would help us break the cycle of battering would be to improve our, our communities, to give us shelter, to give us job opportunities, to reduce the discrimination and harassment that we feel on account of our race and gender. And, you know, one of the big 
movements of the 70s was the welfare rights movement. Like, why should it be that the government, um, you know, in order to give people enough means to survive, like, does all these tortures to women, right? Like, you know, back then, like, you know, even made them basically get their tubes tied, right? Like, you know, no sex. If you have a man in your house, we're going to cut off your baby. Like, these really torturous things. So welfare rights, you know, AFDC was a huge part of the anti-poverty movement and and in domestic violence, women were saying this could really help us. Well, for white women and and middle-class women, and one expert testified to this like early on, like in in the 70s, they actually found that the middle-class white women did not want welfare, right? Because they didn't want to be identified as welfare queens and welfare recipients. So, so that wouldn't induce them to get out of a violent marriage. And moreover, they didn't like the violence, but they liked the standard of living, right? So for the middle-class and wealthy white women, what could be a good outcome for them? Okay, so maybe arresting the man, subjecting him to one arrest, giving him the wake-up call. In the meantime, she gets divorced and then can get child support payments. Like, maybe that's a model that would work for that woman. That's a model that absolutely wouldn't have worked for women of color because arrest was shown to escalate violence, not to be a wake-up call, because it just intersected with all the other pathologies that a lot of the men of color were feeling in their lives, and it, make, it created more stressors and more violence. So that didn't work. So the arrest didn't redu- reduce the violence for poor women of color. And also, like, she couldn't divorce and get child support payments. That, that, that would be like getting blood from return, but that would just lead to a child support system that also further jailed, you know, the, the people in this community. So this model of separation and arrest was really based on a notion of every woman that was really every white woman, right? So, so it's interesting that again, you know, and it, it wasn't just color, it was a whole bunch of intersecting factors. Like for a lot of recent immigrants, there were language issues that, you know, that was uniquely their issue that wasn't captured by the every woman. So that was a very important part, I think, of why also feminism in the domestic violence space went towards, you know, and also I think in the rape space. So the the last several chapters are devoted to um, sexual violence. And I also have some human trafficking discussions there and and prostitution. But again, you know, almost silent was the potential for these really rigid and pumped up sexual punishments, right? That really ascended in this era of, predator panic where you know there's opportunistic predator and that was all white it was it was almost an all white discussion right like white kids white women white offenders you know you know pervert type type guys and so these these punishments got pumped up and pumped up and nobody really talked about whether the policing of sexuality would disproportionately detriment men of color who for as long as there were notions of rape in this country, they were associated with the bestial, savage desires of like animalistic minorities, right? And and when you look at the statistics, there are still disparities in policing, prosecution, punishment, and sentencing lengths for men of color. So, you know, so all of this was kind of like, yeah, women, but certain women situated in a certain place that leads us to be pretty positive towards this criminal apparatus in a way that if you, you sort of broaden the view, oh, maybe you wouldn't have been, you know, maybe you would have looked to other solutions first. Right. So I do have a question that somebody has in the chat box for you. Um, and it's a little long and hopefully, hopefully I don't uh, trip over myself. Everybody bear with me. This is from Nikita Vishwanath, and I'm sorry, uh, Nikita, if I have uh, messed up your name there. I think it's Nitika. Nitika. Okay, see, I already messed up. <laughs> um, so it says, um, do you see the, the question there? You can see Yes, it? yes, okay. yes. Should I so, read it, or do you want to read yeah, it? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and read it, because you're more okay. articulate than I am. Oh, 
<laughs> All right. The, the, <laughs> no, the trajectory of the women's movement in India, okay, excellent, is, um, and its intended consequence of a heavily carceral approach to sexual violence has been very similar to the United States. And I understand that there was a very... Uh, I, I'm just inserting already an answer before I finish questions. So let me just let me just keep reading questions. Beside the over overly punitive approach to sexual violence, there is a recent tendency to dilute procedural safeguards of accused in an attempt to adopt a victim centric framework. Is there a feminist response possible to caution against this degradation of first principles of criminal law and its problem? As a feminist and someone who has worked on rape trials formerly and now works on the death penalty in India, I have been very concerned about this flawed binary understanding of rights of victims and the accused. Thank you, Nitika. I think it's Nitika yes. um, for the uh, for the question. It's it's an amazing question and something that I have actually been in contact with. A, an, an amazing scholar and activist who's at King's College in London, um, but she does empirical ethnographic work, and she did probably the, at least in my mind, it's the study of the Sonagachi red light district in, I think it's Sonagachi is in Calcutta, um, where she studied the sex workers there and the effect of feminist criminal law reforms on their lives. And it's just, a fantastic study finding that, you know, really the position it put a lot of women in was very precarious where they had to bargain in the shadow of these rules where everybody could get arrested. So they had to lower prices, take more risky behavior on. They had insecure housing. So she, um, so again, her name is Prabha Kotiswaran. She's at King's College London. She has been working on some of the rape reforms in India that occurred in the wake of that horrific a uh, rape and killing on the bus um, that just sparked this death penalty response to rape and this really punitive response. And I think, um, you know, you can see, you can see just kind of how the trajectory of India in that space, even though, you know, a wildly different cultural and political landscape tracks the trajectory of, of not only the rape reform movement of the turn of the century in the United States, but also the rape reform movement of the, of the sort of predator and take back the night 80s, where what you had was publicizing of spectacular, brutal outlier cases. Right. So the one where the child was abducted and brutalized and you had the 24 seven coverage of this. So it was whipping up these very raw emotions that are understandable. But these emotions translated immediately into policy and nobody did what you like. It, it's just so amazing because. You want to even do a little fiddling with healthcare reform. You need like a thousand people giving you reports on how much it's going to cost and, you know, what the distributive consequences, the downstream effects and everything else. But when it comes to criminal, it's like, okay, yeah, you know, something really, really bad happened. So why don't we just institute a death penalty in the face of, you know, thousands of sociological studies that this is going to have race and class effects like you wouldn't believe and also accrue power to a government um, that you know, may have very authoritarian tendencies, you know, so expanding the death penalty in this era, like really, that's what you're going to jump to. But I think in a moment of raw, spectacularized, sentimentalized media coverage, the understandable and very noble goal of making women equal intersects with this more basic instinct to, you know, punish the get bad, get a pound of flesh from the bad. And then it gets mixed up in reactionary, pathologically political, you know, government actions. And, and all the rules of good governance or even basic decency policymaking go out the window. And so I think, you know, what we need to insert in that space, and, and we can talk to feminists on this because feminists are usually like 
thoughtful, longer term, you know, social justice actors is to say, look, this is where the feminist dialogue about protecting women is intersecting with these really bad governance, bad governance and authoritarian impulses that are also like racialized and, and, and classed. And we have a whole literature on how spectacular sentimental crime narratives stir up a, a really bad set of conditions that lead to problematic policy. And at least if I can speak to feminists, we can see we shouldn't be part of that. Maybe, you know, opportunistic, tough on crime politicians, they're going to do what they're going to do. They won't listen to us because they don't want to be good governors. They want to accrue power, political power to themselves. But feminists, you're not people who want to just accrue power to yourselves. You're usually people who care about social justice. So maybe you'll listen that we shouldn't be a, a part of this. Um, one final thing on Prabhu Kodeswar, and I know that a year or so ago, she was working on um, some of the, you know, um, legislative package of reforms in India. And she had asked me for some of the uh, reforms to the um, model penal code. That's kind of our model code from the American Law Institute that informs all of our rape laws. And so I know she's been on a, a, a program to, to try to push back against some of the more illiberal, um, you know, policies that are, are coming up in the name of, of feminism in India. Oh, you're muted. Okay, now I unmuted myself. <laughs> so, I mean, that was that was a really great answer, and I think it really, um, she's saying that she's in touch with Pra Prabha. Is that how you say her name? Sorry, I'll get it. I think I think you and I I did it at the same time. Yeah, we keep we keep <laughs> yeah. muting and unmuting. Uh, no, so that's great. I love Prabha. Everyone. She's great. Um, she's my she she keeps me um she keeps me in, in, in touch with, with some of what's going on in India and also um you know we have some scholars um you know that are are um sort of uh, related uh, to the graduate program at Harvard Law School, who are, you know, very deeply involved in the question of how American feminist norms sort of cross the pond, like kind of cross the world and influence human rights discourse in a very carceral way. So, you know, I'm thinking of Janet Halley um, at Harvard Law School, Karen Engel, um, who also has a new book out, a great new book um, that's called The Grip of Sexual Violence, where she really looks at this movement, you know, into international law, for example, in um, the International Criminal Court and Tribunals. So you might want to check out Karen Engel's uh, work. Um, and there's also um, a professor at Cornell, Chantal Thomas, who does work in that space. So I'm more familiar with the American scholars who do some of the transnational work. Um, but but yeah, I mean it's 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 really important, and I and I think it's you know it's it's really interesting. I think it's it's a little bit harder in India because you do see that there are sort of gender norms that may be, and and again this could be all all a lot of orientalizing and you know racism from the West perspective. But you know like feminists you know in the West would say oh but you know it's so bad in India or, you know, Venezuela or wherever, that maybe if, you know, criminal law isn't right for us, it is for them. And I, you know, and I don't think that's the answer e either, but you, you get a lot of all that sort of se sensationalizing. And, and you got that too, you know, in the domestic uh, context here in the United States where, you know, there was like an iconic image of a wife beater, right? Like in a, in a tank top, always, you know, like an ethnic, man, like an ethnic man, a person of color. And in fact, when, um, when, you know, people, suffrage, um, when basically during Reconstruction, after the Civil, civil War, when Black men got the vote, right, there were immediately 
efforts to um, disenfranchise them, right? Like then those efforts are still going on on today with like felony disenfranchisements. And what was really interesting in the South is they had designated rape and domestic violence, quote unquote, Negro crimes. And so, you know, and that, that's how they enforce them, perceive them and very racialized. And so in Alabama, um, you know, one of the, the, you know, Southern white conservative lawmakers said, oh yeah, you know, if we add these Negro crimes of rape and domestic violence, to the disenfranchisement list, we're going to disenfranchise like most of, you know, the, 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 the African Americans. And, you know, what he didn't want to add to the disenfranchisement list was murder, because that was a white crime. So, so it, so, you know, these have always been in racialized spaces. So do we have um, any other questions? Anybody who, I don't see any hands up right now. Um, I, I, of course, have plenty of questions. Um, but do we have anyone uh, who's standing by who would like I to I think I see one from question? Lori. From Lori Kepras. Do I see it? Do you see it? Lori? I'm going to, yes. uh, Lori, I'm going to allow you to talk. Hi, Amber, thank you. So do you have a question? I do, I wrote a long question, but I'm happy to say it out loud. Okay, yeah, Lori, hi. Do that? I'd love to hear your question. Great, well, I, I mean, my, my takeaway, both from your book and my own experience uh, as a defense attorney, is that the carceral feminists have won, that that, that uh, philosophy has really gained a lot of traction in terms of how at least the uh, US criminal legal system has functioned. And because of that, the people who are championing that philosophy and including people who work in prosecution and law enforcement domains, they are getting money to further that message. It may come in the form of government grants, it may come from nonprofits, um, and they have a tremendous amount of political power, they have a tremendous amount of political influence and what I keep seeing is that feminists who do not advocate that same perspective just cannot get a seat at the table. They don't have the resources. They feel often um, that they have to, you know, kind of appeal to the carceral feminists to get any of their objectives advanced. And I'm just wondering, you know, what can they do? Do you have any thoughts given your study of the decades and centuries to, to be part of this conversation. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, and, it, and it's interesting because since I, I wrote this, so first of all, let me say, this is Lori Kepros. She is, um, I'm going to get your title right, the Director of Sexual Litigation at the Office of the State Public Defender for Colorado. And Lori is just, I mean, an amazing person and advocate and, and just somebody who is making such a difference in the lives of formerly incarcerated people and children, right, who are charged with these stigmatized offenses and face really draconian, uh, you know, one could even say uncivilized penalties within a system that just treats them as something other than human. So I think like Lori, people like you are, are, are changing this. And I just, I'm like amazed. Um, and, you know, thank God that the Colorado Public Defender does see impact and litigation and lobbying and changing the law instead of, you know, only representing individual clients as part of its mandate. Um, and, you know, there are also private groups, but they, they have trouble getting the money. And, you know, I, um, you know, I luckily uh, am employed as a law professor, you know, I still teach law and write law reviews and, and I had the resources in my life to devote six years to writing this book. Um, uh, you know, and since I wrote this book, other people have told me, you know, there are some Soros funds out there for people who want to uh, pursue anti-carceral dangerous topics, you know, even ones that, you know, are 
um, Sympathetic to Sex Offenders, which again, another great book that is on my reading list this summer, but I haven't gotten to it yet, is The Feminist and the Sex Offender by uh, Judith Levine. Um, but like, you know, there is some money out there for scholars and I think for groups, but it pales in comparison to the money funneled into uh, policing and especially policing of those considered to be monstrous. And I think even in an enlightened time, uh, people who commit sex offenses trigger the kind of really basic instincts of revulsion that lead to this, you know, sort of bad governance. Where I think this could go, if, if we could capture the moment, and I know a zillion things are happening in the world right now. But I, I think one thing that's critical is in this defunding moment, and I've been writing a little bit about this in like blogs and, and some articles, like popular articles. Um, I don't, I think the what about rape question, first of all, cannot be used to derail the defunding moment, right? Where people are like, nope, we got to keep all those resources to this massive carceral system built around, you know, like sort of sex panic talk about sex offenders. Um, I think, you know, everybody that's for defund has to reject that argument. Um, and secondly, it would be a mistake if defund led to more funding for inside reform in prosecutors' offices and police departments. Because what I've been noticing, which is a little bit troubling, is even the best of the progressive prosecutors still want to be tougher on sex offenses. So funding even in that space, at least when it comes to sort of gender crimes, a la the, the carceral feminist term, you know, the, this, this, this alliance of feminism and carcerality, which really bumped up the two spaces. I think even progressive prosecutors can put money to punishing um, more people, you know, more harshly for the right offenses. And those right offenses are always going to, you know, be at least at this point, feminist offenses. So I think we really need to keep this moment of deep reflection about the state of the American carceral state. We need to keep up the, the pressure that there, there, there should not be carve outs because anybody could have their carve out for, for any crime. They'll say, oh, you know, I, I was, you know, I, and I have been, you know, subject to uh, a violent robbery and I, you know, it really harmed me. And I think that should be the carve out, right? And to say that this is a structural thing. And hopefully if enough of the energy to the Black Lives Matter and current defund, decarceral instincts also can translate into people saying, and hey, yeah, the organizations that are trying to fight against this just horribly carceral and you know, sadistic sex punishment system um, that also captures women in it, um, you know, they should get some of that money, if, you know, if the money comes. Um, they should get some of that money too. So I see we have a, a comment from David Garlock, who, um, so Lori, I'm gonna uh, disable your talking. And um, David, I'm gonna allow you to talk. So if you wanna unmute yourself, you can kind of go over what you put in the chat if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I was just talking a little bit about what you were just discussing, Aya, uh, about the funding. And I mean, I'd be willing to assist in any way as far as looking into um, the individuals that have committed sex offenses in the way that they're being sentenced and the sentences are more harsh than other sentences, you know, and I've worked the past three years with people who have committed sex offenses and have helped them uh, reintegrate into society. And this is something I'm really passionate about. And I am a, of survivor of child sexual abuse and went to prison for taking the life of the offender. So, I mean, I come into this work with a different perspective. Wow, that's incredible. So I do have to say, um, not to plug, but um, David is actually a, 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 good, a good friend of mine and he actually um, uh, shared his story on our new podcast, Amplified Voices. 
that is actually going to be released on August 1st. So um, his episode may be a few episodes in, but um, definitely an inspiring story. Um, I do uh, see a couple of other uh, questions or uh, comments that I'm going to. So uh, David, I'm going to disable your talking. Hey, um, Lori, um, can, can I say something quick? Lori, maybe sure. in the, either in the chat to everyone listening, but you can, you know, direct some people to some of the initiatives that are going on and maybe, you know, where they could help out, like how they could help out and, you know, we could tweet it out too. Yeah. So actually, um, this is being recorded. And, um, so this is going to be on YouTube and then also, um, capturing everything in the chat and we'll be sharing that information out. And there are a lot of really good organizations out there across the country that are doing great work that are concerned both with um, harm, gender-based violence, um, you know, actions against women, things like that, as well as the very significant harm that is taking place um, on the part of the state, which um, a lot of times is a very chronic situation of perpetual punishment, especially when you're talking about um, those who've been convicted of sexual offenses. Um, and also, uh, you talk a lot in your book, I, I just want to mention, we're, we're coming up to the hour, but I just want to mention, you do talk a lot about um, the weaponization of the right type of, of victim. So there is a growing movement of people who, um, at, you know, as we know, people are very complex. A lot of people have experienced some sort of harm in their life and um, actually take issue with the fact that, um, you know, victims are not necessarily listened to all the time and then their um, their stories are kind of hijacked if you will and utilized to promote the carceral state when um, you know that's not necessarily what's going to make people whole again so uh, there's a lot of uh, good organizations out there um, in the New England area a new organization is forming called restorative action alliance which um, I'm actually uh, the uh, executive director of, so we're um, excited to get those things rolling as well. Um, I do want to make sure that we get to a, as many comments or questions as possible, and then I would love for you to be able to share kind of your three ways that you kind of point to as solutions for feminists. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to get to a comment by Tammy Bond. Um, so I am going to let allow Tammy to talk. If you want to unmute yourself, Tammy. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so my comment was that um, there have been more recent studies and research that have proven a lot of, uh, of the myths that are associated with people who commit sex offenses, and they are changing some minds. Um, of course, there are those that don't want to listen to it and um, are on the far side, but they're going to be those people. But as far as the ones that are starting to come to the side of, oh yeah, these laws are too stringent, um, and we have made the this uh, group of people, piranhas of society, and have made all these feel-good laws um, at, you know, like you were saying, at the, at the moment to appease people and think that they're being safe. Um, but what the legislators won't do, um, and I've experienced this myself, is to put themselves out there as a person wanting to advocate for the change of these laws because they're the fear of losing elections and constituents. And here in, Il I'm in Illinois, um, we were fortunate enough to get a bill that allowed a um, committee to be formed of all different um, backgrounds, including researchers, people advocating for um, changes, victims of um, sexual violence, uh, 
public defenders, state's attorneys, just a whole collection of different people on different sides of the table that did a year-long um, uh, discussion about how how these how to make recommendations basically about um, the laws, which ones were effective, which ones were, were not, and they came up with some really great recommendations, but there's no one who wants to go forth with helping to change that. Yeah, these, this is what we found and we agree with it. And yeah, some of these laws are draconian. However, I'm not touching that subject because I lose constituents. Yeah, it's such a difficult thing. I mean, I, I especially for the entrenched, tough on crime politics. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it just, I mean, when you look at the exploding prison population over the past 30 years, hundreds of percent, right? 700 percent. And then you look at the pace of change of the prison population in our reform era, like 2%. Right, like how how are we going to start with these baby steps? And you know, we're at the point where people are are, are willing to say, okay, let's decriminalize some marijuana, maybe you know, reduce some nonviolent drug offense uh, offenses. But how are we ever going to get to the point where we get to the the real thing that's driving mass incarceration, which is violent offenses and extremely long sentences? Um, you know, will we ever get there? I mean, there's there's some hope of the window, you know, the Overton window on that opening with the defund and the Black Lives Matter and people are really thinking about like incarceration is not necessarily being a public good. Can that extend to sex offenders? I think there's been some success and I know there are things in the works here at Colorado with getting state legislatures to at least take juveniles off registries, right? Or at least reduce the amount of time or give judges discretion. They feel like baby steps, but I just think at least right now, the moment to strike is upon us. And it might not last mm -hmm. forever, but hopefully, you know, right now people can start being a little more brave about saying, yeah, and sex offenses too, and violent crimes too. The, these punishments are violent. Jails are sites of sexual offenses. Okay, they are also criminogenic. They leave people without options, right? And they lead to the conditions which cause people to be antisocial or offend, right? Like, I think that, you know, it starts with the dialogue. You have to put enough out there in the world to make people say, I'm willing to take a chance on this or, or nothing will change. I mean, I, and I gotta tell you, like, I even think if my book came out a year ago at the height of Me Too, I get a lot more pushback <laughs> than I'm getting today. And I've been doing this for 20 years, so I'm used to getting, like, a ton of pushback. But now, but ever since 2012, people could just say, oh, it's the new Jim Crow. So that, you know, changed a huge thing. And then now today, people are saying, oh, it's like defund Black Lives Matter. And I'm like, yeah, kind of, right? But it's, it's the dialogue is opening up a space to say true things that the political <laughs> establishment, it's not like you're going to like make it up things. No, these are things that experts know that the sex offender punishment regime is criminogenic, that it causes more than prevents crimes, yes. that it's just terrible in many ways. There's uh, like, if you ask law professors, right, it goes to the economy, they all know. But what you need is enough popular dialogue, right? Like Black Lives Matter, look at Black Lives Matter five years ago you know, the majority of people didn't support it. Now, a great majority of people support it. So things change. And I, you know, knock on wood that, that this is the moment where we can start saying it's time to dismantle this sexual punishment system that, um, that panic built. Yes, true. So um, I am actually gonna go ahead and move into, um, because I did, promise everyone that you would talk about your three, uh, your pathway for feminists to move kind of away from this hard on crime and into a, a more anti-carceral stance while still honoring their 
uh, feminist roots. So can you talk about what those three things are? Yeah, so I think maybe a, a lot of the audience has a lot of experience in these areas, probably more, more, more than I do. Um, but the book, I hope, still hope, and because it's an academic book, I hope that it can be read in colleges, really, colleges and grad schools. Because I want to talk to the young feminists who had you know, who formed their political sensibilities, both in a Me Too, you know, campus rape crisis era, where they got really, you know, like tough on, on sexual assault, tough on gender violence, but also have this, you know, other part of them that, you know, wants to uh, protest racialized policing, prosecution, and punishment. I always call it like the carrying a mattress with one hand and raising the fist at Black Lives Matter with the other, right? So they have this this sort of tension. And I wanted to speak to them and say, you know, I really think it would be a mistake if you took that energy and put it into supporting more and tougher criminal law or maintaining the status quo. And, and, and that's going on, like everything from, you know, sort of new crimes for revenge porn and coercive control and affirmative consent. There's, there's endless law perform, uh, reform proposals coming from feminists today about expanding the criminal law. And in fact, you know, that model penal code I was talking about, one of the biggest fights there, and it, and, it, and it ended up not happening fully, was the model code wanted to basically put in an affirmative consent or yes means yes standard, which would have widely broadened the applicability of sexual assault laws in ways that I think would have disproportionately impacted marginalized men. But in any case, so there are a lot of feminists who are like putting a lot of their energy into those proposals or into you know, more policing in this space or mandatory reporting to the police and, and all these things. So what I'm saying to them is to adopt what I call a neo-feminist point of view, which is you don't have to say like feminist is bad, feminist misguided, it's all white feminism, it's all very authoritarian. You can say, no, 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 feminism is good. Uh, violence against women is a marker of subordination. This is a very important social question, you know, you know women's equality and women's freedom from violence and, and really everybody's equality and freedom from violence. And you can believe that but at the same time, you can realize this. Number one, women's inequality isn't just a function of individual sexist men who look around and say, I want to be sexist. Oh, the criminal law is weak. I'm going to do it. First of all, anybody who studied um, criminology and criminal law as long as I have no, that is not how decisions are made. That very simple deterrence theory of punishment it, it, it's just not true of any crime, much less than, you know, sort of these gender crimes that are so deeply structurally and culturally embedded in a million things that we can change. We can change the culture of how people have sex without having these really broad rape laws because we want people to communicate differently that are only going to affect a tiny little subset of people and they're going to be the least powerful people among us. How's that going to change culture, right? That, like that's not going to change culture. So the first thing is to look at this in an intersectional uh, structural way. And when you think about law, really try to think about law, how it operates in the real world. So what you see a lot of in this feminist lawmaking is like, I don't like revenge porn. That's a bad thing. Okay, I agree. So you know what we'll do? We'll make a criminal law against it. And, and that's it. It's, it's, it's like the one, two step when really I think you have an obligation to trace how, as best as you can, how this law is gonna operate in a real world of mass incarceration and racialized uh, uh, policing and selective policing, right? Um, and, and the internet. So you have to trace how the ripples of that rock you throw into the world as best as you can as a responsible governor and lawmaker. The second thing is I just don't think at this point feminists should be supporting um, expanding the carceral state at all. Um, but there's just no need at this point to make it bigger. And I would say they should even fight against programs like mandatory arrest and DV or you know, registration of sex offenders that actually have been proven to backfire, right? Like that's feminist. It would help women and it would also dial down the carceral state. And then the third thing I think, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, it's a wrong thing to say, like I'm a feminist, so what I'm gonna really concentrate is on like the reproductive health of poor women. Like, you know, like I, I could do that. I don't have to fiddle with criminal law. Like that doesn't have to be part of my feminist agenda. 
I don't have to like say, you know, there's domestic violence. I feminist have to do something about that, right? Because it, it, it might be something that right now is fraught and that people are like working it at the time and there might be other areas that are less um, fraught. So those are kind of the three, three things I study and I, and I, or I suggest. And I did wanna say something really quickly about uh, victims and perpetrators. And I think um, uh, it was brought up by, um, was it, was it, I think it was, t um, anyway. Well, uh, Tammy, yeah, it was brought up by Tammy. Um, you know, what I found as a public defender, and I think Lori would uh, agree with this and a lot of people would agree, is in, you know, during the 80s and in the tough on crime era and predator panic, there was always this idea that it was victim versus perpetrator, right? That there was a criminal class, and this was a very deliberate political strategy, um, a conservative strategy to really look at the problems of, of violence and poverty and identify them as the product of a criminal class that we need to declare war on. And they were wholly separate from the victim class who are terrorized by the criminal class, right? And so if you are tough on crime on the criminal class, the victims ultimately benefit because they are separate people, separate entities who do totally separate things. Well, I think any public defender can attest that you can have a client one day and they are the victim of a crime another day. And, it, and it's true in, you know, DV crimes, you know, DV crimes, especially because you have, you know, inter interrelations, but in any crime, when you have people that are living in marginality and precarity and economic precarity, um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to be victimized, right? Like the, the victims are coming from the same neighborhoods who are suffering the same problem as a perpetrator. So this thought that there is this neat divide between the criminals and the victims, that was just never true as an empirical statistical matter. And it always stood in for a divide between good white women, what, what, what Trump might be calling the housewives of America, right? Housewives of America right now, and scary brown or deviant men. And it was a, it was a political division a symbolic division, but it wasn't a true division. And policy was made in the name of the fake division and real victims. That, now, to be sure, some real victims, what they want is to see the person who perpetrated harm against them rot in jail forever, maybe even be tortured. And then we have to understand the limits of basing policy solely, you know, on what an individual victim wants. Okay, so that's true, but it's also true that the iconic victims and perpetrators, that all of this massive amount of policy, massive expenditures of wealth of this country in caging people, the images those were made on were just racialized, classed, gendered images. They weren't true. So I wanted to add that. <laughs> Oh, that, I appreciate that because um, a lot of things that are going through my head are coming out of your mouth. So it <laughs> That's always makes good. me very happy. <laughs> so um, I really want to thank you for taking the time today. I want to give you the opportunity to let people know where they can uh, find your book, where they can uh, contact you if you would like them to, and any other uh you know, upcoming things that you want to plug. Great. Yeah. I, um, so, um, first of all, thank you all who have read and engaged with the book, whether you bought it or not, just thought about it. I appreciate it so much. And it's, um, you know, when I was writing it, I was like, well, you know, there are upsides and downsides of writing a book versus a law review article. I'd probably you all have never heard of one. But, you know, we do write these law review articles and courts cite them sometimes and other lawyers and people cite them. But, you know, for the most part, you know, it's not as scary because, yeah, it's legalese. But writing a book, you know, the, the bad part is people are going to read it and the good part is people are going to read it. But I just thought, you know, you know, whatever comes at me, I just, you know, I feel very strongly about these issues, you know, as all of you do. And so, you know, I'm so glad that you've engaged with with me on it. I have a um, blog post coming out, you know, I've, I've, I've been writing some blog posts now on um, um, sort of a lot of the themes in the book 
uh, recently wrote a slate piece on sort of how policing and domestic violence come up. And I have a couple of blog posts coming out in the next week. Uh, one is in the Law and Political Economy blog, just sort of, you know, tracing a couple of ideas I talked about, which was this notion that the history of the state response to violence against women was under enforcement, and also the notion of sort of feminism being taken over by criminal law instead of being an active participant. So that's what that blog is about. And then I have a blog post in the gender um, uh, policy, uh, gender policy report uh, that is um, sort of addressing a, a slightly different topic, uh, which is whether when people are talking about gender violence and sort of de-policing and, and feminist contribution to gender violence, you know, I, you know, not in this discussion, which was really great. I love this discussion, but a lot of the questions I've been getting from the press and just other people are like, well, if not criminal law, then what? Right? Like sort of leading with, you better have for me four full pages of alternatives <laughs> to criminal law, or I'm, I'm just not even going to listen to what you have to say. So I wrote this really, this blog to question about that, question that rhetorical move. Um, because in a way, asking for alternatives presumes that the criminal law ever was the preferred alternative. When you go back in time to the original like radical feminism of the 60s, nobody was talking about criminal law. Criminal law was the alternative. So I think we've got to denaturalize the tendency to make people who are advocating for less criminal law come up with some sort of adequate substitute. Because I can tell you from my research on the history, the people invested in the system will always be better resourced and always have their ducks in a row to prove that your alternative is inadequate. So anyway, those two blog posts are coming out. Uh, you can buy the book on Amazon or at University of California Press. Wonderful. So um, Aya, again, thank you so much for joining us today and all of your wonderful work. We'll be following what you you do. Um, we will be publishing this out on YouTube. We will be um, promoting some of uh, your very profound statements on Twitter as well. So look for that. And um, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, if you want more information about the book club, it's um, at amberspeaksup.com. And so our next selection I'm really excited about is a uh, prison uh, by any other name. Um, so you can find more information about that um, on the website. We're going to be doing that in August. So it speaks a little bit to what you were just talking about. Like everybody wants to talk about alternatives. What are the reforms? And so, you know, sometimes the reforms are just reshaping the punitive state in another and almost more harmful way. So um, look for that. As I also mentioned, podcast is coming out, amplifiedvoices.show. And um, the intro for that is going to be coming out shortly. It's not up yet. Um, but keep your eyes open for all of those things and follow Aya on Twitter. Uh, Aya, what's your Twitter handle? Aya Gruber. All right. That's pretty easy. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. We're going to go ahead and wrap this up and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.